Now we start. Uh, I want to welcome today the BioXcel webinar number 43. The presenter is Christian Blau and he will be speaking about uh, uh, density guide simulation combining cryo EM data and molecular dynamics simulation. This webinar is a part of a series of webinars brought up by BioXcel, that is uh, the European Center of Excellence for Computational and Biomolecular Research. And with this series of seminars, we can try to cover different topics of computational biomolecular simulation. And uh, so, you, Everything that you think it might be interesting to listen in this webinar, you are welcome to post on our chat or, uh, or ask by Excel or our forum or uh, just send an email. So I, I hope that the seminar will be of your interest. So now we start, I would like to start with uh, introducing Christian. Christian is, uh, belongs to the Gromax team, and uh, he has done his PhD in Göttingen in a group of Groot Müller in the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry. And since 2015, he moved to Sweden and uh, working in the group of Eric Lindell, in particular, first at the Stockholm University and at the moment in KTH. His main interest is uh, development of the Gromax software package, and in particular, has a particular interest in understanding user-driven development, and also in understanding how simulation and experiment can be combined. And this is probably what is what we will deal in at this seminar. Please, Christian. Now I will provide Christian. The I will give the Christian the option to start. I will share. Thanks, Alessandra, for the nice introduction. And uh, hello, everybody. I hope you're all doing well and all doing fine. Um, mm. We will start in a second. Um, so in this talk, it will be very practical. So this will be a very uh, detailed, uh, practical uh, talk on how to actually do things uh, for the uh, webinar. Um, so you see also some things. So right now I will really go into how step by step and practically you can set up a simulation so that it is run with a certain given uh, cryom density and uh, you might use this for all sorts of densities. I might be talking about cryom densities because this is our main working course but uh, you can use whatever type of density data. Um, some things you might want to do here is uh, that you might try to automate um, model building of uh, structures against the CryEM maps, especially when you have uh, similar structures already built and then a new map coming up. This might be a tool that might help you in the process um, quite a bit. Then another aspect of this is, of course, uh, when you're model building CryEM maps, you can only build exactly one model but you might be interested in um, all the different types of small configurational changes um, the kind of thermal motion that is behind such a map that is hidden um, if you only look at exactly one density uh, and exactly one map um, so you might want to use the tool for this and um, here we can balance between map influence and stereochemically parameters so we have a, a wide range with this uh, tool on hand uh, to explore what happens if we give more weight to the experimental data what happens if we give more weight to biochemistry considerations uh, that are reflected in the force field so if you start um, looking at this whole um, complex of um, density guided simulations in gromics the best thing to do is uh, to read the manual. Uh, I can only recommend strongly uh, doing that. Um, and you find two pages of the manual that are important for understanding the density guided simulations. One that is more focused on the theory in the reference manual where uh, we really lay out the equations um, that give rise to the forces in the simulations. And um, the other part is the more practical side of things in how to set the parameters for the MDP options. 
So in case I'm talking too slowly or you want to read ahead, this is the most essential information to take from this webinar. That is where to find uh, the information um, on hand in quite a condensed manner, however. So, yeah, what we can do now, and this is just a one example of simulation, where you see uh, you have some type of structure and within the simulation right time you want to fit it into a certain density. Um, so uh, this is one concrete simulation result. You just see it rendered here. And uh, one other result you might see here is uh, you, where you want to keep an ensemble of structures close to a certain density. Also another thing that can be done. And I'll just guide you step by step now through the process on how to set up exactly such a type of simulation. So how does it work? Um, how do we refine models against densities? How do we calculate the forces that drive our simulations and that are added to the um, simulations? When we only have a, an atom represented here in green and a reference density, which are kind of different objects and live in, reside in different spaces, so to say. Um, the trick here is that we um, calculate a simulated density from our atoms by spreading them with Gaussians, um, as you see here in green. And uh, once we have a simulated and a reference density, we have things we can compare on equal terms. Uh, where we get some type of similarity gradient measure that tells us how different in each point in space are a simulated and reference density. And also what we can calculate here is um, how does the difference change, um, how strong of a change in density would uh, be required to make these two densities more similar to one another. And this is what we use to calculate the forces then um, that act on our atoms. And you see here that um, the green atom then would finally receive some type of force pushing it closer to the reference density. Then one more thing to consider here is that um, things are not continuous with the densities, but uh, we have some kind of voxel spacing, so things happen in a discrete space, but the same math and the same ideas still hold. We have to just take care that um, to acknowledge that our integrals are approximative here. So this is uh, the picture in 1D in multiple dimensions. This is what it looks like. This is kind of maybe slightly mysterious picture from the beginning. We see a structure in wall and stick representation and kind of a green ISO surface now in three dimensions. It's hard to show this with like a true density character here. So we see green ISO surface that we calculated from this reference structure. And uh, we want to uh, push this structure into the gray reference density here. So we compare green and gray and have some type of um, similarity gradient measure density. I don't go into the details here. You can read that up in the manual um, in, um, shown in yellowish. So the same picture as you've seen just uh, before in 1D, now in multiple dimensions. And from this, we can calculate some type of gradient vector field that allows us to evaluate the forces at each and every atom. So this is the nitty gritty details of how things work technically, um, but uh, they might help you to understand a bit the parameters you might want to set during these uh, simulations. So, how to set up, um, and in contrast to the complex theory I just showed here, the setting up is really easy. Uh, the base idea here is um, to just add density to a normal simulation setup, and this is really whatever simulation setup you wish to have. and um, all the setup for these density guided simulations in this case here are done in the MDP file with all the options just called density guided simulation something. So this is exactly where you want to look for information. And um, if you really just want to go ahead, um, just try the most minimal setup and that is just setting density guided simulation to active. Uh, then all other values will have some kind of default values. For example, a reference density where we expect a reference.mrc density in your MD-ROM directory. Now, the type of reference density data um, is very much influenced uh, by cryem file formats, X-ray crystallography file formats, and what I followed here is uh, the EMDB map distribution format description. So you see a reference down here, but what it means in practice is that for the largest part, um, MRC CCP4 dot map 
whatever uh, formats that have share all the same kind of family of a density file formats um, should work if you have a format that um, you don't know exactly if it works or doesn't you, you will file drastically we check the header uh, the moment we read in the map format so um, yeah just go ahead try uh, your map extension um, if it is close to one of these uh, standard formats then that's all fine we don't use all too much information in the density uh, format header so that's why uh, we are quite compatible with a, a bunch of maps however um, there's some things to be there and uh, this comes with the whole issue of um, density formats evolving over a long period of time in slightly different fields also moving from x-ray crystallography to cryo electron microscopy so we have different conventions in some map formats and tools regarding translation vectors rotation um, so be careful if you use the third party density editing tools clipping off things um, some tools set strange density values um, if you want to make sure that your density um, is really treated the way it looks like in the tool um, I, I could recommend just visualizing in bmd because we use the same density data interpretation routines as VMD does. And also look at your simulations, obviously. Um, so if something really weird happens, then um, it might be a um, density editing issue. Um, and this might be quite tricky. And it's a, it's a bit subtle because there's lots of tools out there that do very different things to the densities. Now, uh, there's yet another thing um, that might make your mind um, go burst sometimes and that is a periodic boundary conditions um, in gromix we like to use periodic boundary conditions to um, simulate the infinite systems and um, get rid of finite size effects but uh, very naturally um, densities have no periodic boundary conditions and the question is now how do we reconcile these two so you see in black on the right hand side of the screen some typical periodic boundary condition setup as it happens in gromics where you have a um, like a lengthy protein and something like a spherical shape just uh, really sketching out this, um, some pbc um, behavior of a system in this case in two dimensions and we have a blue reference density and um, what we decided to do here is uh, to take the center of the reference density as uh, the overall um, reference and then look at all atoms in your simulation system that are closest to this reference density point the blue point here and take these into account so if you run the simulation against this kind of blue density that is just larger than your simulation box which is okay and we can treat that be aware however that um the atoms that will receive and the density being forces that are part of uh, this black boundary box here and that it means that um, we will see some atoms for example in the uh, lengthy shape that will receive no forces because they're quite far away from this blue blur here uh, so uh, there's some periodic boundary effects here to be uh, taken care of and to think of um, the easiest way out here is, of course, if you um, use roughly similarly sized um, maps and periodic boundary um, boxes for your simulations. It's also um, an easy way to gain a bit more performance if you, for example, make maps slightly smaller. Um, that said, um, your parameters to set there to now get started with the density simulations. Um, if you want a brief and fast overview of all the parameters that there are, um, you can just set the density guided simulation active to true, run GromPP, and then have a look at uh, what the default parameters are generated for you. And you'll see something that is reflected here on the right hand side, where you see a brief explanation of the parameter and uh, parameter value that is set. And now I'll go through these parameters one by one and explain a bit uh, what their effects are why you want want to set them what type of ranges you would like to use for certain of these parameters the first parameter to set is uh, what part of your simulation system should be considered for the density guided simulations 
in most cases this might be protein but uh, I'm sure there's a bunch of cases where uh, these groups might be different for example if you have a density that is only partially describing uh, your system um, you can um, choose to also have just a portion of your system react to the density and then uh, the rest of your system will just act as if there's no density or you might even go further and say, okay, maybe you have some type of membrane micelle around some ion channel maybe, and you want to take that into account, you can do that as well um, here by setting the density guided simulation group. By default, it's protein. Um, if you go and want to simulate um, some material science um, things, which you can perfectly do, or maybe not even thinking of cryon densities, of course, um, you would want to be careful to set this group to something more reasonable um, as it's a default protein which might not be uh, even part of your system there. Um, then comes the one of the largest impacts on your decision on how your simulation will behave as a setting and that is how do you even compare a simulated density to a reference density and there's um, three different options available here you could think of many more and um, you could even quite easily implement more into gromics if you're keen to do that um, the choices you have right now with gromics 2020 is uh, some type of inner product um, measure that really makes sure that we force things into the highest density regions um, often might not be the very best behavior you want of the code because then you really will cramp things in too um, much into the densities but uh, it can be the thing you want especially if you have lots of um, unwanted parts of densities um, it has some type of snappy behavior for better lack of a word that means that um, things stick to very high density regions and it's hard to move things out of um, the density once a helix for example has fit in there um, which might uh, make more a bit successful for um, biochemistry deformations um, then uh, on the other end of the spectrum there's the relative entropy similarity measure that has a measure that really looks at the um, difference between simulated and reference density in terms of um, overall information entropy and that sets large focus on uh, overall fit of the two densities and even larger focus on things regions that don't fit so that um, has very nice properties in terms of a uh, smoothness gentle fitting so to say um, but it really tries hard to make all regions fit and fill the void so to say and fill um, all types of uh, extra density you have so if you have a very noisy um, density with lots of extra density that uh, might not just so be so interesting for your system and not even have a counterpart representation in your MD simulation um, this might cause you some trouble otherwise it's a wonderful nice way of uh, fitting densities and as a compromise between the two is a and also the classical option that um, lots of people have used um, in other implementations of uh, types of density guided simulations it is a cross correlation potential um, that shows uh, or has some properties of both the next important um, contributed to how your simulation is running is uh, how you pick the spreading weights and um, thinking of cryem there's a uh, two obvious choices here unity would mean that all atoms just receive exactly the same way so carbon and a hydrogen atom and a um, phosphor atom would all be spread out and have the same contribution to the density here um, this might be a useful thing especially in combination but the density fitting group if you use a protein without hydrogens so protein minus H um, then um, that gives you um, a good approximation to the simulated density and um, at um, some speed up um, benefits even because so then you have to calculate less spreading of atoms if you exclude the hydrogen atoms so that might be a very useful thing to have 
another alternative to that is uh, using the mass of uh, the atoms to roughly and have a rough approximation to uh, kind of a scattering um, properties, uh, scattering factors of uh, different atoms. So um, their uh, simulated density will be proportional to their mass. And as a third option, you can even use the charge, which might not be so useful if you think of cryo electron microscopy. So we will take the partial charge of the atoms uh, assigned here, but um, you could think of some applications involving charge densities, for example. So some extra thing added here um, for you to be creative um, in this case. So. Another important parameter is how much weight do you actually want to give to the uh, reference density you're trying to um, yeah, bias your simulation against. So uh, one of the more tricky uh, parameters to set because if you set the force constant too low you will see nothing happening in your simulation because the force field just overrules pretty much all the forces that come from the density guided simulation. If on contrast you set the force constant too high, you will see that the, the simulation will crash quite quickly because atoms receive all their forces pretty much from the density guided simulations and these forces are much, much higher than the force field forces that keep the protein structure in a reasonable shape as their chemistry, their chemically. And what you would like to do is um, to find the best middle ground here and uh, there you really have to think about the science you want to do, you want to think about the refinement you're doing um, and um, here I really recommend just uh, yeah, be bold, try out things um, methodolog methodologically and try to find the best parameters here um, after some type of uh, scan. So all the city guided simulation and whatever you do uh, we input external experimental data into simulations is a matter of balancing um, different items of information that is a uh, balancing um, how much do you trust your force field versus how much do you trust your experimental data and this is no exception here so this is really um, I cannot give you a very general recommended uh, guide. Another parameter to set is uh, just how blurry do you want to uh, simulate the density to be and uh, there um, we see at the bottom here three different spreading width used so you could say that um, maybe your atom positions are not extremely well defined and you spread them out a lot so you see red very blurry um, density uh, that is simulated you see a middle ground case in green and you see a very peaky um, case in blue now if you imagine you choose an extremely slow, uh, low uh, spreading width of uh, something like 0.01 nanometers, uh, then you can imagine that you see um, only very small peaks at the voxels, so um, a very crisp density. So uh, this is something you might want to avoid. And on the contrary, you also want to avoid spreading out things too far because then um, all the information you input from the kind of structure side of the system is uh, that uh, there's just one large blob of simulated density and uh, you will receive extremely low forces because um, yeah, blob matches almost anything. So um, here again, um, it's a matter of uh, your system um, on choosing a best parameter. However, this uh, seems to be quite robust uh, overall as a parameter and uh, 0.2 seem to be a good choice for the systems we had on hand so far. Uh, note also here that this has a very large effect on the compute effort you will spend when running these uh, density guided simulations. As uh, the larger the spreading width, the larger um, area has to be considered for um, yeah of the density for computation. So it is hard to say exactly how uh, things behave in a complex scenario, but it might be roughly proportional to this spreading width to the power of three. So you see there's quite a drastic influence here of the spreading width. Um, then um, you can set uh, the parameter, I think that is the longest in all of Gromic's parameters, um, and uh, that is a density guided simulation Gaussian transform spreading range and multiples of it. We try to be explicit here and we 
for also we can afford to be quite long here in the parameter name that is one parameter you might very seldomly want to change and um, this parameter determines where uh, your Gaussian is just cut off so as you see at the bottom left here we have a different cutoff length for this parameter just visualized and um, it doesn't make sense to evaluate uh, this kind of spreading Gaussian at a distance extremely far from the atoms and there's virtually no contribution but at the same time also we don't want to cut it off too short on the right hand side diagram you see uh, the behavior in terms of um, this parameter how much of the density is included in um, the overall model if you choose a certain cutoff so if we use a bit of four which is the default parameter then we see on the blue line that uh, almost all of the density is included um, note here also that this is um, slightly different in three dimensions because uh, they be very quickly include more and more density in contrast to just one dimension one dimensional Gaussians um, and uh, so four is a really good um, compromise for including more than 99.99 percent of the density as you see in the red line reflecting the difference here uh, of what is missing um, if you go to two or three we miss still quite some substantial amount and if you go to five or six we just take off way too much but um, all means just to also play and uh, get the feeling for what this parameter does to your simulations um, next parameter to set is just uh, the file name to the reference density and um, there's not so much to note here apart from one exception to the rest of the Gromix philosophy uh, which usually is to condense all run input data into one .tpr file and uh, then be ready to run the simulation here is the exception from this rule uh, the idea being that the uh, density files can be quite large and you might not want to bundle and uh, run them and uh, philosophically have more of an idea of okay here's an extra input stream to your simulation and that's uh, this uh, type of density file you would open um, but this has the effect that um, at grom pp time you can just name whatever file you want and you can just write in this thing whatever string you would like and only when you start your md run um, we will see and check that this file is actually present which um, has the advantage that when you set up your system uh, your tpr file you don't have to have the density file present and uh, has the disadvantage of course that you might get a bad surprise when you run your and you run simulation and uh, your density file is not in the place where it is um, to be expected um, so be wary a bit of this. You can use absolute or relative file names also depending on what you prefer here. So this might be something uh, to be aware if you, especially if you use an absolute file name on your local machine, create a TPR file, move it to the cluster, and suddenly the density file is not found. This might be the reason in this case here. Density guided simulations are expensive um, on the first sight. Um, because spreading atoms on a grid, uh, calculating uh, kind of forces, grid forces, is uh, something that is um, hard to keep up um, in speed with the rest of uh, the force field calculations. So we have extremely long range interactions. We have a one global object, which is kind of the um, simulated density that has to be communicated all over the nodes. So we want to speed up the process without losing accuracy and here the parameter um, that um, allows multiple time stepping will help you a lot um, this is density guided simulation minus nst this is set to one for um, safety reasons so to say um, in our default parameters but for most of the cases you can actually use quite a higher parameter up to 100 um, i would say just from experience and using this parameter and uh, above 100 usually you will see that um, the simulation compute time of a simulation with density guided forces and a simulation without um, is not that drastic so the difference will be um, lesser um, the larger this nst step number is so something to um, to reasonably think but the, what you would like to think about is what type of movements and what type of oscillation periods have the movements i am 
guiding the, the density guided simulation. Another parameter that most often I would say is just set to true is to normalize uh, densities. That is, to normalize your reference density and you normalize your um, um, simulated density. Um, just because it allows a way to have comparable force constants for similar systems. Otherwise, um, some part of uh, yeah, the similarity measure is affected um, by the normalization routine, and this will mean that uh, you will have to have change in force constant to um, catch kind of changes in normalization in density. Uh, however, just make sure if you use some kind of density clipping tools um, or some tools uh, where you say, okay, I, I don't care about some part of the density, I just set it to large negative values, um, then what you will see with this normalization is that these large negative values will have the effect that the sum of all the values in the density will just be negative, and then you suddenly normalize with a negative value, which will result in really weird um, simulations. So, uh, just one thing to be aware of. Uh, anything else? Um, I think uh, we consider this as a very safe option to just keep on true. Then, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, you will be faced with the challenge to choose a pick force constant, and this might be a very hard task to do right and might be quite fidgety to go back and forth with different types of force constants. So, we added another option for the density guided simulations, and that is um, some adaptive force scaling. And the idea here is that you start out with a quite a low force constant, so you would like to set the force constant quite low with this option, and then we carefully notch up the force if we see that um, the similarity between simulated and reference density does not improve. On the other hand, if we see that things are just going fine and we improve the fit, then we scale down the force constant a little bit, but just not as much as we notch it up. And what will happen is that we just go steady and steady and steady to higher and higher and higher similarities. Now, if we went to a very high similarity already and we still keep notching up the force constant because we're still not happy, we will reach at some point some situation where we just apply very high forces to the system just really to make it fit just a little bit better still. Um, and this is quite expected. So um, in this case, in contrast to most or almost all molecular dynamic simulation scenarios, you really want to you drive your system until it crashes just so you can post-process and take the frame where you're most happy with the balance between uh, yeah, influence from density guided simulation forces and your structure based forces. And uh, again, as I said, this balance you have to decide on your own and have to say, okay, where do, do I see the best match between the density and, uh, and uh, still have a good sense for the structure forces. Um, note also, if you want to get a nice um, steer chemistry in the end uh, from structures of MD simulations, uh, one thing that works for all types of MD simulation setups is uh, to actually um, you know, cool down your system afterwards, freeze it to lower temperatures uh, to make sure that um, you take out thermal energy and allow the system to relax again. Again, the setting that is also just possible with um, density guided simulations uh, as it is compatible with really all types of simulations you set up. Uh, there's one other parameter in here that is a time constant that is per default set to some quite impatient four picoseconds. That is um, how how quickly do we scale up the forces um, if we see that the fit does not improve. And um, here again, it's a matter of performance and simulation times. If you want a very very gentle, careful fit. Um, you can choose very large times here. Um, you will observe that in the first part of the simulation that pretty much nothing will be happening um, and then only very carefully forces will go up uh, or you are quite confident that uh, your structure, especially when your structure and density are quite well aligned and you just want the final touch up um, with the density guided simulations, you can choose a quite um, harsh scaling as is uh, done with the default value of four picoseconds here. And with that, um, I would like to thank you. So you, now we should be equipped with all the things 
necessary to run density guided simulations. Uh, as I said before, it's mostly really just add density and uh, get a feel for the parameters, uh, play a little bit maybe. Uh, yeah, make things crash um, if you need to. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, some of uh, my funding agencies, especially by Excel and Kyle Tigger Stifters, uh, that funded uh, pretty much of the um, implementation work that was done in Gromix. And also like to thank uh, Eric Lindahl and all the people in the group, especially the Gromix developers, for looking at my code and telling me how to do things better. And uh, quite some input also from um, people, um, also from Göttingen, uh, that ran density guided simulations uh, in their own uh, comic, uh, Gromix fork. And we had some discussions on how to do things in a good way. So Karsten, Maxim, and Andrea from the MPI in Göttingen. And with that, uh, we go over to the um, questions and answers session, where I hope to provide you some insights that I couldn't yet provide you with the seminar. Thank you very much for um, this uh, very interesting overview of some of the new features in Gromax and for talking us through that, Christian. Uh, there are a couple of questions. If anyone has any questions that they've not wanted to ask yet, please feel free to add them by clicking on the questions tab and writing them up. And we'll get to your questions. Um, we will try to go through as many questions as we can. Uh, the first question we have is from uh, Christopher Linde, who, um, if you would like to unmute and ask your question, you're welcome to. Otherwise, I'll read it up for you. Uh, I will therefore read the question, I think. Uh, Christopher wanted to know, uh, the examples that you gave uh, were mainly focused on, pro on proteins being fitted to densities. Um, I assume the methodology is compatible with RNA structures or RNA co protein complexes as well? Uh, yes, very much. Um, so the whole kind of implementation is completely independent of what type of system you're looking at. Uh, so um, this would work. There's uh, one caveat um, with uh, RNA systems. I think they have um, kind of a cryem densities uh, with a large densities in the phosphorus region. So um, kind of the way you want to simulate your density um, might um, affect the results a bit more than usually with uh, just pure protein complexes. Uh, so in this case, um, yeah, things will work. There might be some uh, not so smooth sailing issues with uh, the RNA protein um, interaction or role because uh, RNA might be a bit too little represented in the types of, of forces it will receive um, in the code. But this is nothing intrinsic to the code. This is something intrinsic in the way how to calculate the forward model. If you want to be more complex here, I think uh, then yeah, um, we might think of some things to follow up in the future to um, to fit even better. But yes, it it will work um, on the outset. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question we have is from uh, Rajat Desikhan. Um, sorry, give me one second to try to unmute Rajat. Rajat, you have been uh, unmuted. If you would like to ask your question, please could you ask it? Otherwise, I will ask it yes. for you. Uh, hi, Christian. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. Thanks. Uh, so I was wondering what sort of initial structures do we use uh, for these simulations? Do we start out with uh, random coils or do we have a, uh, do we start out with some of the defined protein structures out there? Okay, yeah, that, that's a very good point. Um, so in this case, um, we can't do protein folding just with densities because the densities themselves don't have enough structural information and uh, to, for example, um, take a random coil and uh, just run the simulation and hope that at some point it'll fold into a good protein structure that then also fits the density that, that will in almost all cases not happen. Um, so the starting structure should be some type of reasonable homology model. Um, because there's no constraints on secondary structures, however, you will expect to see that um, you see some changes uh, and some folding happening that um, makes 
the protein structure just more close to what is reflected in the density. But it's all a matter of uh, what is in the density data and um, then again a matter of a finite compute resources because uh, yeah it would just take too long to fold the protein kind of in an MD simulation uh, to, even given the, that extra information from the density. Uh, thank you so much. Just uh, can I have a, can I ask a quick follow up question if if time permits? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so uh, f uh, after you fit the densities, uh, if the secondary structures do not conform closely to um, an ideal alpha helix or a beta sheet, do you, uh, should we do any sort of minimization or uh, confirmation sampling? Um, you can do that if you like. This depends on how you want to read your data. Um, so um, the type of ideal alpha helix, beta sheets, and so on, I, idea, I think is, is something that is very much rooted in uh, X-ray crystallography. We have the idea of you have a, a very neat uh, fixed structure at the very low temperatures. If you run MD simulations, you will always see deviations from this because uh, things have a temperature um, also in nature and biology. So um, if you want, um, you can just run, as I mentioned, to some type of a, a needing simulation where you lower the temperature, freeze the system, um, for example, also then without the density guided simulation forces um, added or with, depending on what you like. And then you should see things or you will see things um, become more idealized um, in terms of stereochemistry. Um, but uh, this depends on how you want to report and what kind of properties you, you're looking at. Yeah. Thank you so much. Cool. The next question we have is from uh, Wojciech Kopek. Uh, Wojciech, uh, I have unmuted your microphone if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, hello, everyone. Hi, Christian. Um, I have a question. How much of a manual intervention you need to do with the density and the models before the, the actual fitting? So, so I've been working with Maxim a little bit for a membrane protein fitting, and then there was, I don't know, like five steps we had to do before to kind of trim the map, to make it fit to the initial model more or less, uh, like align the model with the map, and then it, that was like the optimal thing for the actual simulations. So I was wondering if your tool does it a similar way or is it more or less streamlined? Uh, thanks, Julian. Uh, sorry, I had been muted and couldn't unmute myself. Um, yeah, uh, hi, hi, Wojtek. Um, thanks a lot uh, for the comment here. Um, yes, uh, there, there are some things um, you don't have to make uh, the density um, size fit the simulation box anymore. So this was one, I think, one of the things uh, in the, the previous code you mentioned uh, that there is necessary. But you will still have to do some uh, manual intervention to make things fit. So this is one of the like most um, focused on routes now for a future um, improvement of the whole code, um, but something I ha haven't finished yet, and that is that you get automated rotation and translation um, of a, a kind of a rigid body fit um, of your um, simulated density to the reference density. Because uh, we noted that this is one of the major points that uh, are tricky in the setup, and they still remain um, in the setup here that you have to um, have a rough alignment at least of your density and your structure. And uh, the whole Gromic setup routine and uh, the density adding routines overall make this um, something that can be quite uh, challenging at times. So we try to improve on this, um, but uh, not for this Gromics release. For now, um, you can use any type of density uh, kind of size you want, but uh, you still want to like make sure that things are roughly aligned. Okay, thanks. The next question we have is from Christian Margreiter, who uh, does not currently have um, audio tasks questions, so I'll ask it on his behalf. Uh, first, he thanks you for the interesting talk and uh, asks how much more expensive are density guided simulations compared to free ones? Ah, that's a good point. Um, I should have mentioned. and. Um... This depends largely on the uh, end step parameter uh, I just mentioned. Uh, so, of course, if you apply forces every single step, um, they are quite much more expensive than usual simulations. So, up to even five times as expensive, I would say, for a typical system. But uh, then this drastically reduces, and for most applications, is uh, easily reduced by um, increasing this number of uh, this end step parameter. 
So for our typical cases, um, membrane protein uh, refinement, for example, um, and a good balance of in terms of accuracy, we get to kind of 10% overhead, 20% overhead, I would say, uh, in contrast to our usual simulation. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question we have is from Brian Smith, who asks, is transform spreading width the half width? Uh, uh, yes, uh, it's a sigma, so to say, uh, so the Gaussian sigma width. Uh, yeah, so this should be, um, yeah. Um, it should be full with half, is it full with, yeah, full with half maximum, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. The next question we have is from uh, Hugh, Hugo McDermott Opskin, or Opskin. Uh, Hugo, your microphone is unmuted if you'd like to ask your question, and I'm sorry if I butchered your surname. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Um, a fantastic talk. Uh, it was pretty much covered by the previous um, question, but what's the performance overhead? Uh, specifically, does it work on GPUs, or are we not there yet? Uh, yes, it works on GPUs um, in the sense that um, whatever simulation you run on GPUs and then add the density of fitting forces, um, everything else will be calculated on the GPUs. The density um, guided simulation forces themselves will not be calculated on the GPUs. Um, so. Um, you might see a high utilization of GPUs for quite some time of your simulation, but then every step you apply density guided simulation forces, suddenly your CPU will see quite an uptake, and uh, then there'll be some heavy lifting for calculating exactly just this part of the forces. Fantastic. Thank you very much. The next question we have is from Alexander Payne. Alexander, I've unmuted your microphone if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, yeah, so I've been thinking about um, how to get um, sort of a combination of uh, continuously varying cryo-EM density maps or, um, you know, taking advantage of the multiple classes that you can get after doing the processing. Um, and I was wondering if you had ideas about something like a replica exchange or umbrella sampling or, um, you know, building some kind of Markov state model or something where you're you're moving from density to density. Have you thought about applying um, some method like that? Uh, yes, <laughs> a lot. Uh, there's uh, lots of ideas out there. Um, and I know there's uh, some group that uh, did, for example, like a rep multi-resolution replica exchange uh, scheme on for density guided simulations um, and um, yeah um, overall what you can do in gromics um, is just one density your simulation plus one density for now and uh, then of course what you can do is uh, you can go from one state to another state if you have two different densities by just subsequently applying different densities and kind of guide a system first from again density A to density B to density C and so on and get some type of pathway ideas. Um, but then, uh, yeah, there's more sophisticated ideas, but they, there's a whole zoo uh, of that, and we just try to see what is the best way to uh, connect uh, things and hook up things to one another. Um, we implemented things in quite modular fashion, so um, if you're interested to have a look at the Gromic source code, uh, you can see that uh, this uh, whole density-guided simulation thing is set up to be rewired and set up in whatever imaginable um, types of ways for other applications. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Excellent talk. Thanks. Cool. The next question we have is from Yu Du. Uh, sorry, one moment. I'm having... There we go. Uh, you, your microphone is unmuted if you would like to ask your question. Sorry, you sound a bit distant, so if it's okay with you, I will ask the question in your stead. The questions are, is there a very crude guess for the first translations and rotation, or um, 
density guided simulations from the beginning? Um, visualize things um, is the best guess. <laughs> Um, see if uh, your density is um, roughly aligned with your model and then um, if if not um, yeah, you have to do that manually and uh, again this goes back to Wojcik's uh, question yes um, so there's no um, initial kind of um, making things match but we know that there's something to work on um, like first priority actually um, in this type of code um, in the Gromix suit because there's something that is uh, Taking quite some eff like human effort uh, of just uh, having to look at things and making things uh, match. Great, thank you very much. The next question we have is from Sangyun. Sangyun, I've unmuted your microphone. If you'd like to ask a question. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you very well. Uh, okay. Yeah. So my question is, how do we know that the simulation structure converges enough to that cryoEM map? Like, what kind of output should I look at from the simulation? Does it print it out the bias potential value in any output file? Yes, it does. Um, it prints it out in the uh, energy file. And um, this is an extremely good point. And uh, sorry for missing that in my talk, um, because um, there's uh, just the energy file where you can read off temperature and so on. Now, if you run a simulation with density-guided simulations, there's a new field appearing that is um, just uh, saying density, um, dense fit energy, I think uh, it is called, where you can read off uh, the energy input into the system from the density-guided simulation. And this directly translates um, into how well density and um, the structure fit because um, the energy input into the system is really force constant times similarity. Um, so you will see that very directly in the um, output in the energy file using GMX energy. So the unit is kerosene per mole? The unit is uh, SI units, uh, so um, yeah, kilojoule, yeah, kilojoule per mole, yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. The next question we have is from Ali Kusai. Uh, Ali, I... Uh, okay, Ali is keeping it themselves muted, so I will ask the question in their stead. The question is, would it be possible to take differences between two densities, i.e. one from a protein in an open state and another closed state, to derive vectors that may be used to take a homologous protein from a closed to open state? Uh, yes, you can do that. Um, if you have two different densities, um, what you can do, um, similar to what I mentioned before, is that you can have a uh, density-guided simulation that brings your protein into the open state and then just take that open state, run a new um, density-guided simulation into the closed state and see how the protein moves there. Um, you might want to think of, uh, and I think that's maybe what the question refers to, could you just um, take kind of a difference density and um, drive the system pretty much like a driving along PCA eigenvectors uh, between two states just using exactly one density. And um, this is not uh, possible um, if I uh, am not mistaken. But I would have to think that through a little bit more. Um, but uh, the other strategy, I think, it just works as well and um, is, I think, just uh, fair, uh, fair enough here. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, the next couple of questions are from uh, Floris van Eerden. Uh, Floris, I have uh, unmuted your microphone. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks for offering me this uh, possibility as a question. I was a little bit, uh, I couldn't completely get directly your slide about the periodic boundary conditions. So, mm -hmm. you quickly go over it or like, because you said only the part closest to the density of the protein will actually feel the density, if I remember, if I got it correctly. Yes. Um... The, yeah, I can bring up the slide uh, again. And I, uh, so we have 
boundary conditions and uh, some type of density and there's a mismatch uh, for example here and this is an extreme uh, example but um, we, we have a, um, a simulation box that is much smaller than the density and wow. um, here we have the density box in blue that is much larger than uh, the black uh, simulation box and to um, ask now okay if we look at this visualization here, um, we have uh, multiple copies of um, proteins that uh, would be exactly in one density box. And the question is, okay, but which of the copies should receive forces from the density? Should it be all the proteins? Should it just be one protein? And how do we decide what type of um, protein here in this uh, multiple copy scenario would receive the forces? And uh, the criterion to decide, okay, which one of these uh, uh, yeah okay yeah let me say okay so uh, the ones closest to the center of the density and this is just indicated in the black lines in the thick black line you see um that is um the part these are the atoms that receive forces from the density so there's only a one-to-one -one translation so there's never two atoms uh, uh two periodic images that receive forces from the density but exactly one periodic image always receives uh, forces from the density and uh, uh, that is one closest to the density center. Ah, perfect. Yeah, I get it now. So if you just have your boxes more or less equal size, this should not be a big problem then. No, exactly. So if you uh, if the blue box is smaller than your simulation box, then um, there's no issue at all. Uh, yeah. And if um, if they are similar size, uh, also the issue is very small. But uh, it's still important to keep in mind uh, this type of uh, behavior because there's a, a bunch of densities um, out there, especially from cryem, that have lots of uh, emptiness around them. And often you don't even need to clip them to run uh, the density guided simulations. You can use them as is, but then you have to be aware how the periodic boundary conditions are treated. So you might even end up in such a scenario where you have these uh, like small black boxes and a large density, and then placement is a virtually everything here okay yeah thanks for the heads up and can i ask add a second question and i'm just amazed how well protein can get into such a density and i was wondering is there yeah does it often get stuck in a local minimum this can happen yes um so um it's not a single push button solution even though we would really love to have that um so uh, yeah, yeah. Um, there's uh, some things that help uh, that is uh, looking at the kind of different spreading parameters. Um, there's uh, some adaptive protocol, for example, Maxim Igaev had um, developed uh, as published. Uh, there's, uh, what helps is uh, using different types of potentials to minimize uh, the kind of uh, ruggedness of the energy landscape for the fitting process. But these are all different uh, types of considerations. None of them in itself uh, guarantees you that you'll never get stuck in the local minimum, but uh, it makes it easier. Um, yeah. One thing that might happen also for your runs is to run two simulations, um, three, four uh, density guided simulations to see which one just uh, has the best uh, result. So the whole process is stochastic and uh, there will be local minima that have to be overcome. Ah, so it's stochastic. So I don't even need to have to like set a different seat in my, how do you call it, in my normal force field. I, I don't know how you say it. This is the normal part of the simulation, the standard part. It's okay, so uh, yeah, just to make sure there's no misunderstandings here. The forces are deterministic uh, in the way they're calculated, but of course we have always um, numerical noise in RMD simulations that make them quickly diverge uh, on different paths. So, um, and then the, the stochasticness it was referring to the normal stochasticness in any type of MD simulation, and that's exactly what you also see here. Um, so, um, if you do run these simulations with Gromex, and, but if you use four different uh, simulations, even with the perfectly same starting conditions, they will diverge quickly, and then you will see different types of behavior um, that are on average the same, and we know what to expect on average, but not for each and every single simulation. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Thanks for clarifying. And yeah, I really like your presentation. It was very useful. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Cool. The next question we have is a follow-up question from uh, Rajat. Uh, Rajat, your uh, microphone is unmuted if you'd like to ask your question. Um, hi, Christian. Uh, quick question again. Uh, so with the magnitude of forces that you use in density fitting, I was wondering if the choice of force field was uh, immaterial or does it make a difference? The 
yeah uh, that's a very good good question so um you can imagine that um if you use extremely high forces just from the density that um this very much uh, overrules the force field um in large parts and um I think what happens if, uh, if you have lots of information from a density is that um, the choice of the force field makes a bit less of a difference, but it still does make a difference, uh, so you want to be careful. But um, so you say, so to say, you see more geometric considerations taken into account and less uh, of the kind of stereochemistry uh, considerations, depending, of course, on how, you, how large you choose uh, the influence of the um, reference density to be. Uh, do you have a f uh, favorites among uh, force fields? <laughs> uh, no, this very much depends on exactly what you want to simulate. Um, so there's a there's a clear answer, and that is um, you you cannot have a, a favorite here because that is system dependent. <laughs> so <there's>, um, <laughs> for for almost uh, all systems, uh, there's a there's a good choice, um, but um, if you can try any, if you have multiple variants, then use two force fields, as we see in a different case for free energy calculations, for example, um, the work that uh, Vita Tassel Gapshis had done with BioXL, was that um, you're always better off if you combine, if you um, look at results from different force fields, and then at the very end, after having done all the simulations, look at the meta analysis of things. Um, so, uh, and I think this might apply here as well. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is from Javier. And uh, Javier, unfortunately, does not have uh, audio, so I'll ask the question for him. Javier, thanks you for the talk, and asks, do you think we can study protein conformational changes with this kind of tool? Uh, building PMFs for protein transition, uh, transition for instance. Uh, yes, most definitely you can do that um, because you know exactly what type of energy you put into the system from the density guided simulation process. So you can uh, use all types of uh, um, analysis methods that are available for other things as uh, methods as well and um, kind of go a bit into the direction of reading um, density guided simulations as uh, some type of using a collective variable. However, for some reasons, I I would guess um, if you have more information on hand and different types of information like uh, contacts, for example, or even kind of a target confirmation um, whatsoever, these things might be better suited because they have kind of more information. So density information is often ambiguous um, in a way uh, that we just have a blob and there's different ways to um, make a protein fit a blob. Of course, depending on the resolution, um, uh, but there's a, a more clear and direct translation often um, between uh, structural information or dihedral angle statistics or whatsoever uh, than is in the densities. Um, so yes, definitely possible, but uh, think about it if this is really the most efficient way to do things. Thank you very much. And uh, our last question for today is from uh, Maxim. Uh, Maxim, your uh, Microphone is unmuted if you would like to ask your question. Uh, I will ask the question on Maxim's behalf. Uh, Maxim asks, have you done any performance be benchmarking? And if so, how does uh, the fitting part of the code slow down the simulation compared to uh, vanilla MD runs? Mm, yeah, uh, yes, uh, we had done some benchmarking and uh... If, yeah, this extremely much depends on the input parameters. There are some considerations in the manual that uh, lay out like how much um, influence you will see. And um, so there's a co quite of complex uh, scaling behavior, but it slows down the MD run quite a lot if you use n step equals one. The moment you go up to uh, larger values, then much less so, but this is kind of a trivial part of uh, the equation. Then um, impact, comes from um, how large of a spreading width you use, um, how many uh, voxels you take into account, for, um, and uh, how many atoms are being spread on the grid. Um, so it's a mostly um, atoms talking to grid points um, issue here. But uh, there, the, the best I can say is, um, yeah, 
it's extremely variable and dependent and yeah, it can be up to like a, a that it slows your uh, simulation five fold, down fivefold if you use n step equals one um, to um, having just a small overhead um, in the simulation um, and uh, yeah then the reference manual will just have a uh, one formula where we estimate um, the impact um, that's um, all I can say. Um, yeah. Now, I, I think um, Julian is. Uh, Thank you very much. Muted. Ah, they said something. Good. Yes. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you for everybody attending. Now we are closing this section. And I hope, uh, Christian, could you show the next slide? So I would like to announce the new, the following, the seminar that will come after this one. So we will have uh, in uh, the 12th of May, there will be Lucy de Lemotte and Annie Westerlund that will present the clustering free energy landscape from molecular dynamic simulation. And then in, at the end of May, exactly the 28th of May, we will have uh, uh, Brinda Vallet and Benjamin Webb that will be presenting uh, PDB DEV, a prototype system for archiving integrative structure. So please, if you are interested, please enroll in these two webinars that are already on BioExcel uh, webpage. And thank you again for your attention. See you next time, I hope. Bye-bye. <laughs>